Okay, um, right, so I'm going to talk about Ravi, which is a Lua 5.3 derivative. Um, let's get going. So, um, it's a dialect of Lua 5.3. Uh, it features um, language enhancements to allow some static type annotations to be added, primarily uh, so that we can do better JIT compilation, which I'll talk about. So it allows you to mix static types and dynamic types as far as possible. Both uh, Lua and Ravi functions can be JIT compiled either automatically or upon request. There are two JIT compilers available. One of them is using LLVM, the other one is using libgcc JIT. I don't know if you guys know about that, but that's a new JIT uh, library from GCC 5.2 onwards. Um, so it's not very mature yet, so there are some bugs in it, but nevertheless it's working, functional. So the unit of compilation is a Lua closure, and it's important that it's a closure. So you know, Lua the functions don't have a namespace or a name as such; they're just values. It's not 100% Lua compatible, so I didn't want to call it like, you know, give it a name with Lua in it because obviously it's not fully compatible. Uh, it uses extended bytecodes to allow, uh, you know, type-specific operations, and we'll go into that. And for some of the benchmarks, uh, it matches Lua JIT performance. Right, so how did I get started uh, on this? I had, I was looking uh, for an embedded scripting language for an application back in 2014 and you know I looked at various languages and Lua was the only one which was small enough and did all the things I wanted in the way of interfacing with the application so got interested in Lua at that time and also got interested in Lua JIT for obvious reasons but the problem with Lua JIT I found so I was trying to initially write code that worked in both Lua and Lua JIT but I found that Lua JIT had some problems, like it wasn't portable and on platforms, um, you know, it, it required certain, for example, on Mac OS, it requires certain parameters which interfere with, let's say you're embedding in another application, you don't want to mess around with some of the parameters and things like that. So I thought, okay, maybe I should try and enhance Lua JIT and fix it, but you know, it was just too hard because I felt it was a multi-year, it would be a multi-year initiative, just trying to enhance it. So then I thought, okay, let me try and see if there's another way. And the, o the other way is basically to help the JIT, or add JIT compilation to Lua, but help it by providing some static type information. So I don't know, I guess Lua JIT doesn't need that because what it does is trace compilation. So that means that it knows at runtime what code is being executed, right? So therefore it doesn't need the static typing information because it, it knows that information at runtime and it generates code at runtime based on that. But for a standard compiler, which is, which is trying to use compiled dynamic code, the type information is missing. So then the optimizer or the JIT compiler can't generate optimal code. So you know, the options I had was to do what Lua JIT is doing or to do something different. And I just chose the easier approach. Right, so if you compare what I've got now, which is uh, as of today, and if you compare that with Lua JIT, then obviously I'm using LLVM or libgcc JIT, JIT compilers. Lua JIT has its own custom tracing JIT compiler, 
So JIT compilation in Ravi is slow because obviously LLVM, if, if you've used LLVM JIT compilation, you would know that it's not, um, it's certainly not nowhere near as fast as Lua JIT. There is a large runtime image because LLVM is huge in terms of the binary. And there's no support for dynamic linking of LLVM. So you've got to include it in the binary itself, statically linked. So that makes the Ravi binary pretty large, 15 megabytes, I think. Even though the code itself, the Ravi code itself, is much smaller than LuaJIT in terms of code size. So obviously, it's, this solution is not suitable for small devices. It's a much simpler implementation compared to LuaJIT, obviously, because there's no assembly in it. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of stuff, complexity in LLVM, but all that is in LLVM. The Ravi code itself is plain C and C++, and much more simpler. There is no FFI binding, uh, and that is try kind of deliberate because I guess I was looking to implement this for an audience which was not programming, programming, you know, very skilled programmers. And that's the reason partly why I chose Lua as well, because the idea was the scripting language would be very, very simple. And I didn't want to introduce something like FFI in there because that just exposes the potential for, you know, blowing up everything, really. And I think you, I think uh, one of the presenters mentioned that as well before. So it needs to be, so the scriptable scripting language had to be safe like Lua for ordinary people who are going to be users of the system. And to me, you know, the performance and small runtime image were not the top priority. They were priorities, but bigger priority was also to make sure that I had a system which I could support, maintain, enhance, and so on. Right, so how does it work? So you can, you can provide some type annotations for local variables. Uh, at the moment, uh, I've only implemented four types because these are the most important ones for, for my use case. Uh, so I, I was doing this to solve a problem, right? It wasn't a project for the sake of defining a new language. It was trying to solve a particular problem, and that problem was in the domain of numeric computing. So therefore, the most important types I needed were integers, doubles, uh, integer arrays, maybe not so much, but definitely double arrays. And so you can see on the right hand side some example code. What that's showing is that you can annotate uh, the local variables as integer or number, as you can see. And what that results in is an extra instruction is being edited here to the load iz and the load fz instructions. They initialize those local variables to zeros. So this is slightly inefficient because the load nil is obviously redundant in this case. So that's an optimization I could do, but I haven't bothered doing that. So local variables which are annotated, they are initialized not to nil, but to zeros. And these static types, as I mentioned, I was interested in because they are most relevant for the stuff I was trying to do. So you can also annotate function arguments in the same way. So here you have uh, an example shown which has an integer variable and a, and a number array. And what you can see is that in this case, one, when you enter the function, there is a type assertion being done in the bytecode itself. So the bytecode generator says that the first argument is expected to be an integer, and the second argument is expected to be an array of numbers. So in the first arc, there's slight difference in the behavior of these two bytecodes because the first one will try to, do a con try to do a conversion if possible. The second one can't do a conversion, so it will just throw an error, basically. So why is this check at runtime? 
this check has to be at runtime because otherwise, if you if you don't do this at runtime, you can lure being a very dynamic language where people are they can load code from a string, from a file, they can write code at runtime. It would be impossible to guarantee this. Because the JIT compiler needs to have a guarantee that when it looks at a particular local variable, it is of a particular type. Right? Okay, so, and the same problem applies when you return values from a function. So, in a Lua code, you know, it's dynamic, fun dynamic uh, type values, so they can be of any type. So, here you have an example which shows a uh, value from a function being returned and stored in a local type variable called i, which is uh, annotated as being integer type. So, what happens is, after the call, there is a two int instruction inserted to say, assert that the type is either int or convertible to an int. Similarly, the function, the next line shows the function called and the value being saved to a number array. So in that case, there is an, an, a, the same two array instruction that we saw before has been inserted to say, please assert that the local variable is of the correct type. But you can also see that in the assignment statement, where it says f equals bar, the compiler knows that f is of number array type. So it instructs, it uses a special move instruction called move af. So what that means is it's, it knows that it, it's expecting a number array to be assigned to the variable there. Right? So again, as I said, these runtime assertions or conversions are needed to guarantee to the compiler the types of the variables. So what are these arrays? Um, the array that you can see here, for example, is basically a subtype of the Lua table. And I'll go into that in a bit more detail later on. What this example also shows is that there is static checking done where possible. So in this example, because f was declared as a number array, you can't assign a string to it. The compiler itself throws an error saying, hang on, I, I can't allow this. But if you look at the next example, where there's a table initializer, and the values in there are strings instead of numeric values, the compiler can't check this at compile time because of the fact that these could be expressions, right? So therefore it needs to check at runtime that you can't assign string values to a numerical array. So that's what I said. It's a mix of type checking at static com compilation time or at runtime. And that mix is needed because of the dynamic nature of Lua. Right, so what are these arrays? So these arrays are really, they look like tables. They're basically extensions of the table type. So they look like tables, and if you pass an array to a Lua function, it looks like a table. But there are some restrictions. You can't assign the wrong type of value to the table, and so on. You can't do meta methods on table, on these arrays, even though they are table subtypes. They have additional fields in the Lua structure, table structure. I'll show that in a minute. The array data is held in a contiguous space. So that's, that means that it, for example, the garbage collector doesn't have to scan the array. So that's a big benefit. If you imagine that if you've got a large array, I think, my understanding is correct, that the Lua garbage collector has to scan the whole array, right? Because it doesn't know that these are primitive types. Whereas here, we know that the array is made up of primitive types. And so there's no need for the garbage collector to scan it. And the other advantage of having it in continuous memory is that it's compatible with you know, passing it to C functions and so on, which we'll see an example later on. So arrays are initialized to zero. For performance reasons, you know, in the standard Lua implementation, when you access an array, there's always a, the index is always adjusted to being from one 
because you know Lua indexes start at one, but in the C code it starts at zero. So there's always an adjustment. But that's an overhead. To avoid that overhead, what what I have done is basically allowed an element to be present at index zero, but it's not visible in the normal Lua code. So if you draw, if you no access arrays in, in Lua normally, you can start from one, or if you do pairs, you will start at one. But you can still access the element at zero. It's just that it's not it's not hidden, but it's is there, but it's not you know meant to be done, meant to be accessed in that way. So the initializers, for example, that we saw before in the previous slide. The initializers like this start from one. They don't start from zero. The extra slot at zero, though, is quite useful because that's just extra eight bytes of memory. So you can exploit that. And for, in fact, I exploit that, for example, to extract the array and cast it to a vector which has a size element at the beginning. Because those eight bytes are not used, they are used. They are available for some use. Unlike Lua, if you are act, try to access an array element which is out of bounds, you will get an error. So it's not going to return nil. You can create slices from an array. There's a library function to do that. The slice points to the main array data. So that makes the main array, you know. It's, it, it becomes fixed in size once you create a slice. Because if you modified the main array, you could reallocate memory there. So then your slice will be pointing to garbage. And obviously arrays cannot shrink, um, at the moment at least. And the growth is dynamic, except that you must allocate the last plus one slot. The arrays maintain their length. So we don't have this counting issue that we have with standard Lua tables. So we know the length. The normal Lua hash and array parts are still there, but they are not available from you know programs generally. And the obviously having these types means that the compiler can optimize code for array access, which I'll show in a minute. And the C API allows direct access to the array data. So this is what I've done to the, this is how I've modified the Lua table structure. So as you can see at the bottom right here, you've got the Lua structure, but I've added a, uh, an element there for Ruby array. And that's got some information. It's got the pointer to the data. It's got the length. It's got the memory allocation size. Plus it's got a type which is can be numeric array or integer, sorry, double array or integer array. And it's also got a modifier. Modifier is used to say this array has got a slice, is a slice, or this array has become fixed in terms of size. You cannot resize it because some of the slice is pointing to it. Right, so how does this help? How does all this help? So obviously, Here's some code. The Lua code on the Lua function that you can see there is just a simple function to sum uh, an array. It's being passed uh, an array, and all it does is it sums it up and returns the sum. So in Ravi, you have a utility function called dump Lua, which will dump the byte codes for any Lua function. Uh, and what you can see there, as, as mentioned before, the first the argument is converted to an array or checked that it's an array type. But then what you can see below is also that the standard for loop has been modified to for prep i1. So this is a, a type specific for loop, which is saying that the compiler knows that the index is, is an integer index and it's got a step size of 1 which is the most common use. That's the most common type of array. And that knowledge is extremely useful to the JIT compiler, because the JIT compiler can generate much more efficient code once it knows that. 
The second, uh, after the fork crack, you can see that the get table opcode has been modified to say get table from an array of numbers. So that information is now available to the JIT compiler. The next instruction, which is doing the addition, add, has been modified to say add ff. Add ff means I know both of my arguments are numeric arguments. So I don't need to do runtime type checks. So what you can see is the result of all of that is the whole of that for loop is inline assembly code generated by LMP. All the addition, the array access, the loop, everything has been so start the, the first call there is just getting the length of the array. But then the loop starts here and this is the loop. And what you can see here is completely inline assembly code. There's no function call. In the normal lower code, a get table would be in a function call. Add FF would have significant amounts of code because it does all kinds of type checks. Even the four prep loops in normal Lua has type checking because there's checking of the step, the index, and so that just means that the compiler just can't optimize the code. Right? So, here's another example, and this, uh, I guess this is trying to sh show that um, that you standard some of the API calls that we get work as normal. So if you have a function which is a standard Lua function and if you pass the integer array to that Lua function, as you can see from the output from that function, it just looks like a table. And the standard Lua table functions like unpack, length of a the table, they all work. Similarly, you can do pairs. Uh, just as normal. So they look like tables in standard Lua code. So there are some other bytecode extensions in Ravi. So firstly, for num loops are specialized. So when the index is an integer and the step is positive constant, which is the most common use case, the bytecode gets specialized. Bitwise operations get specialized when the types are known. So if you look at the example function there, that's doing a bitwise and. And you can see that the instruction generated is b and i i, which is saying that I know both of my arguments are integers. So again, this will result in inline assembly code. Numeric operations are specialized when the types are known. We saw an example of that before where uh, the addition was specific to the numeric type. Up value access is, is also specialized. So for example, here in the function here, you can see that k, the, the variable k is being accessed in the functions that is returned, closure that is returned. Now variable k has been assigned to be, or has been annotated to be an integer type, so now, because that's been captured and returned in the closure, the closure should not subvert the type, right? So the way that is assured is by the fact that the setup val instruction has been amended to say that only integer values can be assigned to that. Because otherwise, you would subvert the type. So, there are a number of bytecode extensions in Ruby and uh, what I've done is here, I've shown what the Lua original bytecode is and the extensions that Ravi has. So as you can see, Move has four extensions um, and so on. The ones which are in red are, are not compiled yet into bytecode. That means that the binary, uh, sorry, the bitwise operators, when they're specialized, they get JIT compiled. But if they're not specialized, then I have not yet implemented the JIT compilation of that. Similarly, those ones, the setup uh, val ones are not JIT compiled as yet. The rest are all JIT compiled. So I guess um, this is always probably thing that people want to know is how does it perform compared to Lua JIT? 
So here's some benchmarks. Benchmarks are always misleading, I guess, because they only, you know, they only do a micro test. And in the real world, a lot of factors come into play. For example, I have benchmark code where Lua performs better than Lua. Did. For example, I had a function which manipulated lots of strings. And surprisingly enough, Lua was faster than that. So you know, you can't really tell from a benchmark whether it's always going to be the case that some, some implementation is better. But these micro benchmarks, which are just designed to test core numeric functionality, I think, they show that Ruby can reach logic performance. Right, uh, this is another interesting comparison of performance. So this is a particular benchmark which was here in the previous slide, the last one, which is a matrix multiplication. So this matrix multiplication is implemented in Lua. And here you have the version being run in Ravi, but in different, Ravi and Lua J, but with different um, you know, variations. The first one is just interpreted standard Lua code. And if you compare that with Lua 5.3, it's slightly slower than 5.3. And the reason for that is in Ravi, you have additional type checking happening on some of the array operations. But then if you just JIT compile that Lua code using in Ravi, you only get 50% of the original performance. I mean, in the sense that it speeds up by a factor of two at most. And the reason for that is there's still a lot of dynamic type checking going on. And the JIT compiler just can't optimize that code because it doesn't know what the type is of each value, right? So just JIT compiling Lua code isn't going to give you the most optimum results unless you know the types. So then Lua JIT obviously is very fast. Um, and it's very fast to do the JIT compilation as well. But then Luajit, what Luajit is doing is really is, work, is knowing, it working out the types at runtime. Because it gener generates a trace of the code that is being executed and it does an optimistic, heuristic kind of thing. Where it says that, okay, I assume that the code will continue to use these types. And if that, those assumptions are broken, I believe it has to recompile. In Ruby, of course, it's a plain old method com compilation, so you can previously you can compile up front, um, and the Ruby code is quite fast. But if you just ran the Ruby extended code without JIT compilation, it's slightly faster than the standard Lua code. So that means that although the JIT compiler has helped a lot by the type information, the actual interpreter isn't helped so much. And the reason for that, the interpreter, the cost of each instruction is significant. So, you know, and the cost of jumping from one instruction to another is also significant. But of course, you know, performance doesn't compare with open glass. So in open glass, for example, it takes, the same code takes 0 0.046 seconds. When people say Lua JIT is as fast as C, that's probably not 100% true. So obviously open glass is of course written in assembler. But what, I, what is also interesting is that if you use user data with meta method indexing, how fast is it? And that's actually terrible. As you can see, it's worse than even Lua code, standard Lua code using tables. And if you add type checking to that, user data without type checking takes you know, several, three times more time to run. And if you add type checking like, and this is an optimized type checking based on you know, things I found on the lower mailing list where you, know, you assign the key to a void pointer and so on. It is very, very slow. So what this is saying is that the user data indexing feature isn't suitable for any kind of performance critical thing. So Ravi also, 
so that's just that was just you know description of what how, how Ravi works and what uh, what bytecodes there are and so on. This is these are some of the API functions that Ravi provides. So you can have a JIT compilation mode which is on or off. You can dump Lua code. You can compile a specific Lua function. You can set some auto compilation which is quite primitive at the moment. I believe. I mean, when Java's first JIT compiler came in, probably they had some primitive features like that. Obviously, it can be made much more sophisticated. You can dump the LLVM intermediate code. You can dump the assembly code. You can set optimizer levels. In LLVM, the best optimization level is two, I found, for Lua code. And you can also create the numeric and integer array type values and the slice values through the API. On the C API side as well, you have some extensions to allow creating arrays and slices, as well as checking whether a value is array or a slice or a tape, you know, a numeric array or not. You can also get access to the raw data. Now if you imagine the raw data is very useful because so in, in a matrix library I'm working on, I have these arrays defined in the Lua world. They look like tables or arrays, but in the C world, they look like standard C arrays. So I can pass values backwards and forwards without any conversions. So these are some observations on LLVM. Uh, it's very well documented, intermediate representation. It's got a builder for building these instructions which has got type checking in it so it's very good it catches lots of silly mistakes it's got a verifier to run on your generated intermediate code so that catches lots of mistakes and the best thing is that you know you can use clang to generate LMBMI intermediate code so you can actually see what a given piece of code should look like and then you can use that to generate your own the negatives are really, it's very low level, so the intermediate language is almost like an assembly language, so you have to do a lot of tedious coding. It's huge in size, and uh, it's also costly in terms of compilation. And I also mentioned that you have to statically link LLVM. So Lua's JIT, sorry, Ravi's JIT compilation architecture is really that we compile a Lua function, each Lua function is compiled to a module function in LLVM. The compiled code get, gets attached to the Lua function prototype. Hence my question that can we share prototypes? Because obviously it's very expensive to compile Lua, this code. And if you have several Lua states, the code is probably the same. So you should be able to share it. The compiled code gets garbage collected as normal by Lua, so that means that when the Lua function goes out of scope, it's garbage collected, the whole compiled stuff gets thrown away as well. Um, the decision to call the compiled code is made in the Lua infrastructure, so that means when a Lua code, when a Lua function calls another Lua function, it always goes through the Lua DP call in LDO.C and that decides whether there's a compiled version available and whether I should call it or not. So the JIT compiler translates bytecode to LLVM intermediate code. It does not translate source code. There's no more support for inlining Lua functions. Now this is another difference between Lua JIT and Ravi because in Lua JIT it traces the bytecodes being executed. So if there are functions being called in a chain, because it's tracing the byte codes, it's inline essentially. Whereas we are not doing that here, so there's no support for inlining. And normally, the instructions in the in the JIT compiler are basically an expanded form of the Lua VM code, except for these op codes, which are just function calls. The reason is they didn't seem worthwhile optimizing because none of them are usually in critical you know, loops or anything like that. Or the overhead anyway is big, so there's no benefit. So 
Ravi represents Lua values as standard Lua, so that's the 16 byte structure. I did experiment with uh, NAND tagging, but that didn't help. Okay, so we have some problem areas, or things that haven't been done or don't work. So the first problem is that the Lua program count of saved PC is not maintained in JIT code. So that means that the debug API only works partially. It can't find where the current code is because it needs to have that uh, variable. So maintaining a program counter variable would obviously inhibit optimization because it would mean that the optimizer can't rearrange code, right? But perhaps um, in the future I could have a debug mode. So if you ran the compiler in debug mode, it could insert instructions to update the saved PC. Coroutines don't execute in JIT mode. They only execute as interpreted code, and that's because I have no way of resuming a JIT jitted version of a coroutine. I believe Logit does it, but I don't quite know how it does it. Tail calls are implemented as normal calls at the moment. There is possibility to implement recursive tail, call, tail calls in the JIT code, but I haven't looked at that. And currently, I've only tested for 64-bit integer implementations. So my aim is not to just build the language, but well, also provide some libraries. And, and my interest is primarily in providing numeric stuff. So. I've been working on things like a matrix library, a wrapper for the GNU scientific library, a symbolic library, which is going to be probably a wrapper for Sim Engine from SimPy project. And maybe, maybe I'll add more, but the focus is primarily on what I need for my purposes. So I've got a couple of slides just to close this uh, out. So firstly, in Lua, bytecode is generated while parsing. So it is harder to implement static file checks. So I've had to work around some issues and has made the implementation a bit ugly. And I'm not 100% confident that all corner cases are being caught. Obviously, having an AST will make it easier, but then there'll be a lot more overhead. It was one of the lowest benefits is the generation of bytecode is extremely efficient. It doesn't do any memory allocation, right? It just that uses the stack. It does just for It's extremely, extremely efficient in how it generates a bytecode from source code. To trying to do AST straight away means you've got to do memory allocation. So straight away, you know, you just kill from a performance point of view. On the plus side, though, having an AST would really help to have some kind of macro capability like a metal lure. Uh, parsing and code generation, unfortunately, isn't very documented and it's quite complex. So that's been one of the hardest bits to understand and enhance. Maintaining compatibility with Lua is obviously one of my aims with 5.3 onwards. But you know, depending on how Lua evolves, how much change is going to be needed, I don't know. So I've tried to keep my code base as compatible with the Lua code base as possible. So I don't want to invent a new parser or a code generator or anything like that because that will mean that any enhancements that happen, I will have a hard time to pull them in. And that's the problem Lua JIT is having. That's why it's not easy to update Lua JIT to 5.3 because everything has been rewritten. So you can't just merge changes. Ravi as it stands is a very specialized dialect, I think, for a particular use case, which is maybe desktop server computing, and maybe numeric computing. So it makes it difficult for other people to contribute to Ravi, I guess, to get people interested enough. So far, I've not had anyone saying, here's a piece of contribution for me. Obviously, making it a more generic language would entail better support for aggregate types, 
but this is very hard in Lua, for example, because of the dynamic nature of Lua and the semantics of tables. I mean, there's another language called REN, which has tried to do this, but instead of a table, I think they've gone for a struct aggregate type. So table is just, a, I guess, just a collection. So in, uh, obviously, Luajit, pure Julia languages like that provide FFI, but there's no safe way to do that in Ravi. Pure and Julia are really type languages, so for them it's easy to do FFI. LuaJIT does it because I think although it's Lua, actually the, the CDEF declarations that you saw before in the previous presentation, they, they are, the compiler knows about them. So it is kind of has type information. Function calls, I find, are comparatively expensive, so it would be nice to be able to inline Lua functions. Um, so that's the reason I would like to have macros. Um, and it would be nice to be able to share code across Lua states, because the Lua JIT compilation process, at least using LLVM, is expensive. Sorry. And some thoughts about Lua. Uh, it's obviously small, but very powerful, quite powerful. It's obviously very carefully designed, you know, like, Everything seems to have been thought through, like every line of code. I think it's a somewhat geeky language because it seems simple to start with. But actually, certain things in it are not so simple, like for num loops are mentioned here only because there is a variable there which is automatically a local variable, for example. That isn't <coughs> obvious. Um, if you come from other languages, the fact that the for num loops variable becomes a local, despite lacking a declaration that is local, is not intuitive. Logical operators, you know, they return the, whatever the value is that is not nil or false, so that means the type can be dynamic, that's unusual. Meta tables obviously is, an un, you know, somebody coming from, say, I'm thinking here in terms of users who are not sophisticated programmers. You know, for them, these concepts are not simple. Obviously, it's got a DIY class system and core routines. So these things make it somewhat geeky, I feel, in the sense that for if you just go and say this is the language for somebody who is a novice to learn, then these things probably will not be the most helpful things for them. It's got a core VM which is very well defined and encapsulated in an API. Even the standard Lua API libraries have to go through this API, which I think is excellent because it makes your, you know, the exposed amount of interface is, is restricted. So you know if you've got this working, then everything else will work. And obviously the test harness that you mentioned has been absolutely, you know, fantastic for my purposes. Uh, because it's helped me to identify bugs, fix problems, and it's very expensive actually. And it, although you said it's the purpose is not to test the language, but I think it does check the language features as well. Uh, unfortunately, Lua is not very well known in all, in my company. I work in a financial services company, and nobody knows Lua there. <laughs> yes, I mean, my ambition is, you know, I would love to have something like R. R, I don't know if you know, there's a statistical language. Something like R in Lua, you know, where people can write. Because R is a very, I find R is a very bad language as a language. But it's got a lot of capabilities. And what we need is those capabilities with a nice plotting capability. And then probably we'll have some competition to R. I think that's it, really. The less, that's really it. What am I doing for time? Perfect. Okay. We have time for questions as well. Excellent. So that's that's really it. Any questions? Okay. Yes, I'm I'm wondering a bit why why you went down this approach as opposed to the approach of things like numeric Python, making a, a numeric uh, 
library source for these kinds of computations from the non defined language? Why do you choose this approach? So I think that's fine. Uh, in fact, I started like that. We'll just have the library and C and so on. But I found that the main reason was this, this slide, really. I mean, if you go back, this is the real reason. The fact that there's no way to index in, in Lua code. So where I was coming from is I've got this, let's say I've got this uh, solver, which is trying to solve stuff. And the solver is, is written in C++ or C and whatnot. But it's calling functions which are the objective functions, they are written in Lua. So the Lua function needs to efficiently access the arrays that are being passed to it. There's no way for it to do it. There's absolutely no way. And that was the reason why I had to find, come up with this array type, so that I could inline the code that accesses the array elements. So that means that you know, if you had a solver which is calling Lua functions thousands of times, and each function is supposed to do some numeric computation, it would be extremely inefficient. So it's basically because you need callback functions in your yeah. numeric analysis. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I was going to say that uh, that's actually a really impressive project. So even if you haven't got the contributions yet, <laughs> I think that's really, really pretty cool. And so. Going back to what you were saying about the, um, the pros and cons thing, am I right in thinking that because this is all generating LLVM intermediary code, uh, this would therefore work on any platform architecture supported by LLVM, which would be a larger set, I assume, than what the legit supports? That's true. Uh, I would only qualify that uh, I've only, uh, there are some assumptions in my code, not in LLVM obviously, that the integer type is 64 bit. Yeah. So, and floating type is a double. I mean, we can, I can relax those. It's just, I have not had an incentive to do that because I'm working on a 64 bit sure. platform. But unlike Lewajit, which is kind of. Yeah, so here you get portability for free, basically. Yeah, yeah. You're getting portability for free, story. and you're getting um, optimization for free because LLVM, obviously, yeah. you know, I mean, in you one of the benchmark, the first benchmark, yeah. first benchmark there, both Lowajit and Ravi are fast because the array is completely, sorry, the loop is completely eliminated. They both realize, LLVM also realizes that this loop isn't doing anything. What, what the loop does in the code, it returns the value of the index, right? So in both cases, they just optimize the code to just return the value of the, the array, the size of the loop. So they just bypass the loop completely and that kind of optimization you get for free. Yeah, the whole making it. Everything, and as you know, LLVM is being worked on by all the major companies. Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's they're quite. just, you know. I think it's a matter of time before the JIT compilation becomes super fast as well. I want to know what was the, uh, the level of complexity of the translation between the uh, Lua or Ruby and Python and the LFM and higher uh, compiler so it can be a difficult task as the model quite matching or are they really different? It's mostly it's fine. It's just that some some of the Lua bytecodes have a lot of type checks. And the Lua code looks very simple, small, but the LLVM code corresponding to that is pretty large. So you know, for example, you have add. Add looks simple, right? But in, in the Lua VM, it's a few lines of code. But you know, one of the misleading things about the Lua code is there are lots of macros there. And they have separate actions going on. So even though the code looks compressed, Actually, there's behind the scenes, there's more things happening. So when you expand all of that out, there's a lot of if-else branches there. And so that means the LLVM code has to do lots of things. And that code is quite tedious. Yeah. Yeah. And, and do you think that uh, starting from the uh, source code, meaning building an AST and Yeah, I think so. I think so. For example, it would mean, for example, better information about types. So you could do ASTs and things like that. Uh, 
obviously you could also, one of the optimizations I'm unable to do, and I rely upon LLVM to say, okay, if I've got lots of numeric actions happening, then I want LLVM to figure out that setting the type is unnecessary, right? Because, because you can save that, because you can see, but the problem is that because the Lua stack is an array, you know, there is some rules in C code, C optimization, that if you have an array, the optimizer doesn't know if it's being aliased elsewhere, and there are some restrictions. So sometimes it is unable to optimize. So one of the optimizations one could do if one was writing everything from scratch is not use the C array, not use a separate stack, but use the standard stack, C stack. But that would mean a whole rewrite of the GC and everything else. So in, in, you know, for me, the balance is that I want adequate performance, but I want the ability to take changes from Lua and get the benefit of all the Lua work that goes on. If I did everything from scratch, then it'll be like Lua did. It wouldn't, it'd be very, very, fra you know, impossible to upgrade it or change it going forwards. So. Uh, on that uh, next performance slide, No, okay, it's just pure logic. As well. Have you done conversion of that as well? Uh, this one, you mean? Yeah. yeah. You have you have logic choosing FFI. What? What? You have some C code somewhere or something? No, I think um, the binding. No. Uh, obviously, the binding itself it doesn't play a part here. Uh, I mean, I think the difference wouldn't be any at all. You know, it will be the same performance of Open Blast. Open Blast, mm -hmm. of course. One thing I have to say, although the open glass is written in assembler and it uses <coughs> core, several cores on your machine. So obviously on my laptop, this has got four cores. So I'm assuming that it would have used all four cores. So you could have like the same performance with Lua if you find it with the open glass. Yeah, of course. But then the work is being done in open glass. Yeah. My point was that you couldn't rewrite in Lua and get Lua JIT to get you that performance. Yes. And as you can see, the difference is significant. <coughs> yeah. I have a question. Uh, do you use the LVM IR, and I have to decide between the two of them. Yes. Uh, do you use Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's why um, I've made it clear that we have excluded the LLVM compilation time in comparing. But bear in mind that um, obviously the model in Ravi is that you compile, you can compile the method by once, and you can use it thousands of times. Because um, there is an API available to just explicitly say, I want to compile this method. And I guess the use case I have is you have a bunch, you have a module which is a table of functions. I'll compile all of them first, then supply the table. So then it's pre-compiled, 
you can execute as many times as you wish. It's like a library function. It doesn't need to be recompiled again and again. So the cost of compilation, therefore, should, in my view, be excluded because it's immaterial in that use case. Obviously, if, if you're, if you're co compiling your code again and again in a very... I can give you an example, the test harness that uh, is there. It runs under one second in interpreted mode on this laptop. But it takes about 74 seconds to run when full JIT compilation is enabled. So that's just the JIT <coughs> compiler go, you know, compile in. And, and the, your, the test harness produces thousands of functions. So imagine all of those thousands of functions. And these are very small functions. They shouldn't be JIT compiled. But there is a mode here which says JIT compile everything. And that mode then takes 74 seconds to run the same piece of. So obviously, in the Java world, there's been a lot of research done on when to JIT compile. Uh, and there's a lot of research done on hot replacement of stacks and everything. Now, I haven't done any of that, so you know, for me, it's a very simple approach at the moment. I, I feel as a user, if I could explicitly say, because I, I tend to think that users know which functions they wish to make faster. So if I could say explicitly, I want to just, just compile these functions because I know these are expensive, that's good enough for my purposes at least. If you warm up logic in these tests, so sorry? it has a compilation. No, in fact, I should have done that. I haven't, yeah. sorry. You mentioned, uh, and I know that the LMTM is huge amount, it's a huge model. What about this alternative of GCC? The GCC JIT is also quite large. It's also quite large. And how large is that for a real program, I mean, not for benchmarks, compared with the size of the data, etc.? How do you mean? The binary obviously is. I mean, when you run with real matrices, etc., mm -hmm. real programs, yeah. how this size of the uh, in in memory, memory mm -hmm. if, yes, in memory, if the rest yeah. of the real memory you need to run your program. That's an interesting <coughs> question. I haven't checked it. But yeah, I, mean, I should probably check how. what is the loaded amount in memory. It probably won't be the full image, because I'm sure it's not loading the entire 16 megabytes into memory. And, and I don't know about logic, but I, I know at least for JavaScript uh, trace compilers, they have a problem of hoarding memory because they start doing a lot of traces. So also they can be small, but they use large amount of memory. Right, so. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so with trace compilers, that's why you can see one of the benchmarks, LuaJIT actually does worse than this four num loop test three, it does worse than rubbing. The reason is that, I guess, the reason is that it's having to do the traces again and again. Yes. Because this loop has two loops, one inside the other. But you don't have memory information. I haven't measured it. <coughs> because I've taken it for granted that LBM is bad. <laughs> but I should measure it. But I think, I have asked the question from the LLVM community is to, you know, one of the things is, as I said, I'm mapping a Lua function to uh, LLVM module and, sorry, where was that slide? Sorry, can't find it. I'm mapping a LL Lua function to an LLVM module and LLVM compile function. So what, but what I need to do is really, all of that can module and all can be thrown away. Because all I need is the actual compiled code, the, the, the real machine code. But to implement that, you have to provide LLVM with your own custom uh, memory manager. So I haven't done that yet, but you know that will mean that you can throw away everything except for the compiled actual compiled function. So then your code, after you've compiled, is only as big as a C function. So that bit I haven't done yet. Sorry, there was a question from. Uh, yeah, do you, do you know how much of the, the um, compilation time is split between your code that translates into IR and the actual <coughs> LLVM? No. Um, 
No, I haven't uh, done a measurement. So I don't. 199% is LLVM. It has to be because. Yeah. Seems. Yeah. Seems like it. LLVM is doing so many analysis yeah. passes. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. It's just. Just sorry. touch on that memory. <laughs> 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 Was there a question from that side? <coughs> no. Okay. No, so I think I, it, could, it would be possible to add um, a return type uh, to a function declaration. But you have to remember in Lua, functions are not, they are, they are values. They are not like functions as in other languages. They don't have a declaration. So the problem is you can define something in that source file that as long as that function was visible in the same scope, the compiler could detect. But if that function was loaded randomly or reassigned <coughs> to that variable, the compiler has no way of knowing. So it needs to assure, it needs to be absolutely certain that the type is correct. Yeah. Yeah, so I think in, the, in this example, for you know, sorry, where is it? Yeah. So in this example, for example, if, if the compiler knew that bar was returning an integer, yeah. then it could, in theory, omit the type assertion, right? You're saying that's possible. But to me, it didn't seem like a worthwhile optimization because it felt like, I felt that because of the dynamic nature of Lua, only in, only in a very limited case you would have that knowledge. Well, so it didn't seem worthwhile. Well, if they were local, presumably, then you can reason about them at yes. the file time. So maybe that would get you some of the benefits that you don't get because you don't have inline in that maybe at least if, if everything's local, you can make certain optimizing assumptions there. Yeah. I guess so, I guess so. I mean, and that's something... Make much of a difference in real world. Yeah. I mean, my, my approach now is to try and get more libraries implemented so I can really test it. Because one can keep on working on the language or enhancements, but unless you have real world <coughs> uses, it's a bit hard to kind of prejudge what you need. Right? But there's a lot of stuff that could be done. For example, I mentioned one could replace Lua stack with a native stack. There's a lot of things one could do, but that's like a project on its own. You could avoid the step of the just keep variables in. But the GC would, that's the only problem. No, and GC for has to scan for, for numeric values at least. If yes. more values, a number you can keep in a LLVM rest temporarily. I do do that for for loops. Yes. The for index yes, is maintained. Do that for to do that all over, you have to kind of do a static analysis mm -hmm. of which which value is escaping. Mm -hmm. Because anything that's escaping, you yes, can't. True. So I did post a question on the naming list. Has anyone ever done a static uh, analysis of Lua code? Yeah. I didn't get any response. So I guess nobody has done that. But yeah, in theory, when you look at byte code, you should be able to work out that some values are not escaping and their types are known. So therefore, they don't need to be on the Lua stack. Well, if they're temporaries, for example. What do you mean by escape? Oh, escape to escape. other functions. To escape to analysis to yes, see, yes, 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 you yes, know. Yes. Yeah, because if anything is being assigned to a mm -hmm. local or escaping to a function call, then you can't just, you have to put them in the Lua stack. Yeah, it should be easy to do that. Yeah, so I was surprised because nobody responded, so it looks like... I, 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 I never <laughs> done that, but I, I, I'm sure That'd be fantastic, easy. actually. So, right, any others? Or are we done? Okay. <laughs>